We've been talking about the Holy Spirit for uh, probably six weeks. It has been something that God just let be born out of my own heart. Uh, y'all ever get thirsty? I got water over here. Jim Mills always gives me water. That's a good thing. When you get thirsty, you want to drink. And I've been thirsty for the Holy Spirit. So I've been uh, listening and asking, seeking, uh, wanting very much for the Lord to have more of me than He's ever had. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about really as quickly as I possibly can, seven things that the Holy Spirit does in our life. The first one you'll find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You pray for my friend Kale up there. He's going to turn these scriptures on the board real quick this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I want to talk to you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. It says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse number uh, let's look at verse 12. For as the body is one, has many members. We are God's family, but there's many of us that make up that family. But all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. But it says here very plainly that we are baptized into one body. It uses the term baptized, immersed. Jesus came and was baptized, not because he had sinned, but he was yielding himself to death to the old life. He was walking the human life. He had, the Son of God had been come to this earth, born of the babe in Bethlehem, and he had been humbled to that. But now he was going to the ministry that he came to, to, to bring to us and to perfect the, the ministry of the cross. But it was always the good news he tells us about in Luke 4. He came to preach freedom for all of us in captive. He uses the word baptized, fully immersed. When you come to Jesus Christ as your Savior, we all are baptized. But it says one baptism. We're baptized together. When a person becomes a Christian, you have everything that you need when you are immersed in Jesus. Now, in that day, if a person wanted to be a, a convert, to Judaism, you had to be baptized to be a Jew. When Jesus came, he said that, that we are born of uh, water and, and the Spirit. You were to be baptized. And by the way, I've, I've always thought it strange that everyone wanted, to have, everyone wanted to have all of Jesus, but only wanted to give Jesus part of them. They said, I, I want you to forgive me. I want you to give me new life. And, and, and I immerse myself in you, but I, I, I won't show it publicly by being baptized. They're, they're putting limits on. God never put limits on what he gave to us. So it says that we are all born into that wonderful, glorious thing, the body of Christ. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, in, in verse 4, it says, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. There's not 10 baptisms. There's not 30 baptisms. There's one baptism. Giving Christ your all, letting him, being fully immersed in him. It comes at the time of conversion. Now, before then, they said you had to be born in water to be saved. That was because that, that, that was how they were converted in that day. They said that if you were to be a Jew and you wanted to come to, to or you were not a Jew, a Gentile, and you, you had to be baptized to become a Jew. But in, in that day, they were saying, this is the act of showing. Now, later on, Peter or and Paul would come and would lay hands on them so they could receive the Holy Spirit. But folks, today, we don't have to do anything except Christ in our heart. 
And when you find the end of yourself and you say, Lord, I want all of you, he gives us all of himself. The Father's still on the throne. Jesus is on the right hand of the Father doing exactly what he needs to do. But he sends the gift of the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to complete us, to make us one in him. Number two, the first one is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you receive Jesus Christ, you are given the gift, not plural, gifts. That can be expressed in a hundred different ways. But you are receiving the gift of God giving to you the Holy Spirit. It is a gift. It is precious. It is ours. We don't want to take it for granted. We love what God has given us. It's the perfect gift. Now, he is the perfect God, but all of us are different. Y'all good with that? We all have different quirks about us. We all have different needs. Some of us are strong in some areas and weak in other areas. But that one gift fulfills them all. Look what Scripture tells us in Acts chapter number um, uh, 11. Acts chapter 11, verse number 17, it says this. It says, If therefore God gave them, that is the, the Gentiles that got saved when Peter went to Cornelius' house, he said, if God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? He was, the other peoples were saying, hey, these people got saved, but no, they've got to be circumcised. They've got to be baptized. They've got to do all these other things. And, and Peter just says, look, I was there when the Holy Spirit showed up. I saw what God did. In, in Acts chapter 10, verse 45, it says it this way. Let me, let me start in verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, the Jews, who believed they, they came with Peter, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. It's a gift. Don't think that you've earned it. It's God's gift. You just receive it. Salvation has been a completed work. Now, a lot of people will tell you, well, to get the Holy Spirit, you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this. Just believe, repent, trust, give Him your heart and life. If you mean it, he means it. And he's not going to hold anything back from you. You will, the God who has the treasure of eternity, who has all the riches of glory, is not going to say, no, 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 you can't have that. That's too rich for you. No, no, no. He's going to give it all of you. Understand, one baptism into one family, one gift can be expressed as the Holy Spirit works through you in a hundred different ways. But we received one gift, His Spirit, into our lives. Number three, number three, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter number three and verse number 16. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, the indwelling. He says, <clears throat> do you not know that you, now maybe y'all don't realize that he's pointing his finger at you as well. When he says you to them, he's also speaking to you as well. The Bible transforms all through time and speaks those same truths to us. He said, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? This is a building. We got stained glass, but there's nothing holy about stained glass. We have chandeliers. There's nothing holy about chandeliers. We got a brick facade. There's nothing holy about a brick facade. We got a sign out front that calls us a church. That's not what makes us a church. All these physical things are not what it's about. This is just a building where the church meets. And it's not about the building that he feels. It's us that he feels. Please hear this. God wants to flow in you. 
He doesn't want the Holy Spirit to be grieved. He doesn't want it to be hindered. We need to get the trash out of the way so he can come in and take over and fill our lives. I've heard the illustration, it's not mine, but I'm just sharing it with you, that, that, that our house is, or our life is like a house. That uses the word temple here, a, a sanctuary for God. But, but when we get saved, he wants to come into our house all of our life. Now, we have locks on the doors in our life, in our house. But he wants Jesus to have the key to all of them. In our life, we may have this thing that we want to do, and, and we think that I can go there and, and, and I can do that all by myself, and I'll keep Jesus locked out. No, he won't say that. You know, when I was a kid, uh, some of y'all still have houses like this, not too many. But when I was a kid, we would, we would have a house that there was one room that was always clean. My mama made sure it always was clean. Saturday morning, she'd make us clean the house. But you, you never knew when company was coming over. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And I never really understood it because when you had company, you always sat in the most uncomfortable clean room. Those chairs that nobody ever sits in with the cushions, you know, you had to fluff them up because they get dust on them. Now, the rest of the house was worth living in. That's where the den was. That's where the TV was. That's where the bedrooms were. That, we, man, we had all kinds of stuff. But, but that one room, y'all, how many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Sometimes we want Jesus to come to the formal room. Because he, and it's like we want to set up a throne in there. And if we ever want to talk, we'll, we'll go in there to that room. But Jesus wants to have freedom to go everywhere we go. The indwelling means I want him to have all of my heart and my life. He can have it all. I'm not going to hold anything back from him. There should be no secret places. There should be no closets that if you open them up, all this junk would come out. Lynn and I were a young couple, and uh, we didn't have anything, by the way. Things have changed. we got a whole bunch of junk now. But we were, we were at these, these friend's house, and that she was going to have a, uh, a dinner party. We got there early, and, and uh, she was cleaning the kitchen. Y'all ladies know what it's like when you're cooking and you got all those things out everywhere. But you, women don't want anybody, women want their kitchen to look like it's just come out of good housekeeping, you know. And, and it, so what, I, what we found was that uh, Evelyn was her name and she was taking stuff and putting them in the stove. <laughs> and shutting, she says, nobody ever looks in the stove. And she was hiding stuff. She had drawers just to hide stuff cabinets you wanted to open the cabinet real slow because all the other stuff look if you are holding back you're holding back the precious hand of god you're holding back you're 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 damming up the free flowing movement of the holy spirit in your life he wants to indwell within you if you don't think anybody's watching he is his spirit Praise with our spirit to heaven, but the spirit also links back to God. You know, in my heart, there's some things that I would be embarrassed if you knew that I thought about. Would you? I had a friend this week call me, and he had gone through some troubles a while back, and uh I walked with him through it. It was tough. About three years, he, he battled unforgiveness, depression. He, he battled all that stuff. But the Lord brought him out on the other side. It was a good thing. God's prospered his life. But he called me. And the same thing that he battled before, he fell into again. Y'all know what I'm talking about? When we open the door, you know, if you, I've worked with addicts for a lot of years, but I always tell them, look, shut that door to all those old other stuff. 
Lock them out. Get them out of the house. Clean the house. And, and lock the door. Put the dead boat. Get you a dresser and move in front of the door. Get you some two by fours and, and, and block that thing off. Put you some, put you some sheetrock around it and a new picture because you don't, you want to forget that ever was there. You want to, don't ever crack the door though, because if you crack the door to all that old junk, Satan will come and kick that door in and it'll be worse than it ever was before. My friend called me because it was worse than it was ever before. And I love him. And I'm going to be there with him. And we're going to walk through it again. And our God is gracious. But what we need to realize, if we're holding back from God, we're handcuffing the almighty hand of blessing from doing in us what he wants to do. There needs to be free indwelling of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of our life. Number four, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to the book of uh, Ephesians, to the first chapter. And I want you to hear these great verses. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13. In Him, that is Christ, you also trusted. After you heard the word of God, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed. Now, that might not mean as much to you today as it did to them. Today, we would say, I I'm going to write a letter, a very important letter, and we would write the letter, and we would put it in an envelope, and then we would put our tongue on that awful taste and stuff on the back side of it, and we would lick it, and, and then we would seal the letter, and it would stay sealed until it found the place to where it was supposed to go. But in that day, what they would do is they would write it down, they would roll it up, and they would put wax over it, and then they would take the seal of their ring, and they would seal the wax. They would put their stamp on it. So it would be closed, and it would be fastened, and everyone else would know who it was from, because that's whose seal it was, and it was supposed to be remained uh, unopened until it found its place where it was supposed to be. So there's real three quick things I want you to seal about this sealing. Number one, when, when they sealed that letter, it meant it was a finished transaction. The letter had been written, everything had been said, and it was done up. And when they sealed it, everything in it said, this is what is good. This is what is right. It is done. It is finished. You don't have to open it back up and write some more. No, it's done. Number two, it shows ownership of the person who sent it. It's his seal. Number three, it's security. Everything that goes with that person who wrote it, his promises, meant it was his and it now belongs to you. Folks, when the Holy Spirit came into our life, it said it is a finished transaction. He comes and dwells within us. He lives within us. He is there, and it says that our salvation is done. Amen? It's a finished transaction, and I now belong to him. Satan can come at me, but when he, seals the, when he sees the seal of the Holy Spirit, he, can, he is limited to what he can do in my life. He can influence me, but he can't touch me. He has to get permission from Jesus to even come close to touching me. That's how it was with Job, remember? Jesus, Jesus said, you can go this far, but you can't go one step further. He put protection around him. And it's, it shows that we belong to him, and it's the security. As long as we're in the hand of God, we're good. Folks, the Holy Spirit is important. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, one time. The gift of the Holy Spirit, God's best for us. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, He's not a visitor. He needs to be at home in us. The sealing of the Holy Spirit. Number five, the earnest of the Holy Spirit. Look what it says <clears throat> here in verse 13. He says, in Him you also trusted, having heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed that it's Christ, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee, who is the earnest of our inheritance 
until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of the glory. You know, the new King James says, who is the guarantee? The old King James uses that word, he was the earnest. He's the prepayment. My wife does real estate. And she'll uh, have somebody that she's working with and they'll find the house that they, they want to be their forever home. And she's representing them and she'll go to them and she'll say, all right, well, this is the price you're willing to pay. They'll agree to that. But they just to make sure that, that, that you're going to come through that you say you're going to buy the house, but just to make sure that you're going to come through, they want to have some earnest money. That means if you break your word and you don't buy the house, they get to keep the earnest money. That's a guarantee that you're going to come through with it. You know what God in heaven is saying? I know I'm up here doing my job. I'm preparing a place for you. But I've sent my spirit to be with you and help you. But just so you know that I haven't forgotten you, I've sent the Holy Spirit because he is the down payment. He is the wedding ring. He shows, you know, when I gave my wife that engagement ring, we weren't married yet. We got the wedding bands later. But that engagement ring meant, until then, you're still mine. You hear me? We have been bound. He says, I will not forsake you. I will always be with you. And just so you know, have you ever heard anybody get mad at God and they say, God, if you don't come through, I'm just going to get mad at you and I'm just going to not believe in you anymore? That's the silliest statement ever, right? Because all we have to say is, oh, but I've got your Holy Spirit. You can't abandon me because you can't abandon yourself. You can't leave me because you've given your spirit to live within me. Folks, it's promised. It's promised. Number five. That was number five. Number six. The filling of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter five says this, verse number 18. It says, be filled with the Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. No. Many people get filled with the things of this world. But he says to us, be filled with with the Spirit. Now, hold on. If the Holy Spirit is living within me, how can I not be filled? It's like a glass. It's got a capacity. Some of us want to add a little bit of this to it. Some of us want to add a little bit of that to it. But he says, I, I, this is what I want for you. Clean the glass. Empty all that other junk out. Cleanse it with the precious blood of Jesus. And then let me fill it up. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You remember the old commercial, a little dabble, do you? Well, some of y'all come to church. Oh, I'm sounding mean. I'm not trying to be. Y'all know that little cup of we give for communion? I mean, it's hard to get wet right there with that just little cup. Y'all come and, and you get a little sip of Jesus and it's supposed to last you the whole week. And you'll come back next week and can I have another little sip? Your Bible doesn't get open. You forget to pray. You're not interceding on the behalf of someone else. You're not sharing your testimony of what God's done for you. You've got your own situation that you figured out, this is what I'll do, this is what I'm not going to do, this is what I'll give up to Jesus, this is I'm not going to give up to Jesus. It's my choice. I'm going to do it. And you put parameters on your Christian life. God help us. I love young Christians. I love them fresh out of the baptismal pool. They get saved. They get happy. They come out of the bapt baptismal pool. You know what I mean by it? You, remember, you know the look on their face after they get baptized? And they grin from here to here? I mean, that smile just gets so big. And they're just so happy and they're just so excited. On fire. On fire. What happens? Well, the cold water committee comes. <laughs> I actually had a young man who felt the call to preach. His last name was Talent. He was extremely talented. 
He could sing. Oh, my goodness. He could sing. He was smart. He could build anything. He was just a one of those guys you hate because they're just so talented. And, and he could do anything and he could do everything. And he 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 felt he was he was saved and he felt and he said, God's called, called me to preach. And back then, that was when the preachers always thought it was wise to talk them out of it. The, their wisdom was this. If I can discourage them, if I can talk them out of it, then, then they really didn't get it to start with. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You know what? They need some encouragement. They don't need everybody else telling them how hard life is. They'll figure that out on their own. They're going to go through hard times. They're going to go through circumstances. All of us are like that. We don't need to lower somebody down to where we are. We need to let them lift us up to where they are. Church, one body, one spirit. You might have a bad day today, but come and let the Lord fill your heart. Get the junk out. Let the Holy Spirit flow. I want to be like a fountain. I want it to be where, where not only am I filled, but I want to splash on you. And it might be that I need you to splash on me. I may be tired. I may be weak. And I need you to come and, and, and just put all your goodness. Sometimes I need a holy hug. Sometimes we just need encouragement. Did a service yesterday for David. The one thing I felt when I walked into that room yesterday was there was a whole lot of love in that room. There was a whole lot of encouragement in that room. There was a whole lot of hope in that room because we knew that, that David had given his all to Christ. Listen, and Christ had given his all to David and everybody was good with it. Nobody was begrudging that he wasn't here anymore. They were grateful that he was in heaven. I pray that I will live a spirit-filled life. And I pray that it's contagious. And I need to see it in you to be encouraged in me. And I want to be an encourager to you. Number seven, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now there's one baptism. Y'all got that? That was the very first point. But there are many anointings, many anointings. Jesus, when he came in Luke chapter number four, when he was beginning his ministry, he had, he had gone and been baptized. He had, he had gone out into the wilderness. Satan had tempted him, but he had come in and he was going to tell everybody what his life was going to be about. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He has anointed me and has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has anointed me to proclaim liberty to the captives. He has anointed me to preach recovery of sight to the blind. He has anointed me to set me at liberty to set at liberty those who are oppressed. He has anointed me so that I can proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The anointing is the fresh touch of God. When I got ordained it to the ministry many years ago. Oh, they preached at me. I had three sermons preached at me. They prayed, and then at the end of it, they brought me here, and they put my wife right there, and I got on my knees, and all the ordained men. Now, you have to understand, I come from the tribe of Levi, my daddy was a preacher. He had two brothers that were preachers. I got six cousins that are preachers. My oldest brother's a preacher. I didn't want to be a preacher. I had my life all figured out, but I got hijacked by God, and he made me a preacher, and I'm very grateful for it. Very grateful for it. But there were people in that church, that, that church that ordained me into the ministry. My dad had preached that when I was four years old. They, they saw the four-year-old Brian running up and down the aisles, had the little leather shoes. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And I'd rub them on the shag carpet. How many of you remember shag carpet? And I'd rub them on the shag carpet, and I'd go up and touch them, and that little electricity pop. 
Those, those, those men that used to bribe me with chewing gum, y'all kind of like Jimmy Walter, and he'd, he'd give me candy. And I, did, I can't tell you how many times I got beatings for sliding on the stairs and the railings on the stairs as a kid. I was kid from head to toe. And those same men came and put hands on me. And they prayed blessings on me. And tears would fall on my coat, on my back, as those men cried over me and said, Lord, use him. I always saw a spark in this boy. Lord, use him. Lord, you anointed kings. You anointed prophets. You anointed Jesus. Anoint this young boy for the task that's ahead of him. I've been down many roads. Some of them were kind of bumpy roads. I've been through all those little things of life, and I just tell you what, God planned it for me, so it had to be good. But that didn't mean it was easy. I've had to trust Him along the way. Sometimes I'd lag back. Sometimes I tried to get ahead of God. But He was always there to walk with me. And if He ever sent me to do anything, He promised that He would be with me and be Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who would provide. When Jesus took his disciples and sent them out two by two, he gave them power over all the things that we, he said that he would do in Luke 4. If he gave them the ability to do what they could not do, don't you think he can give us the anointing to do what he's called us to do? He'll not send you unless he enables you. Every step of the day. But yet we act so defeated. I don't know. You know, sometimes I listen to Christians and it's like our God is broke. Jesus is in poverty. He's the King of Kings. Well, I can't. No, you can't, but Jesus can. I'm grateful that when he saved me, he baptized me, he filled me, he indwells me. I received the gift of his love. And for some reason, in all of us, he wants to use us. It's not what you can do for him, it's what he can do through you. Oh, I wish the preacher go, well, I got my task. And I'm responsible for that, and I'll answer to God for my task. But what about yours? What about what you're supposed to do? If he promised that he would be with you, if he said that he would anoint you, that's to empower you. Can't he take care of you? The most overlooked thing in the Christian life is the work of the Holy Spirit within us. Some of us are so scared to let the Holy Spirit take control. Some of us like being in control. We don't know that we like to Give all that up over to the Holy Spirit. He may ask us to do something we don't want to do. And as a kid, they always talked about going to Africa. Hadn't got there yet. But that doesn't mean I haven't been working. People used to say, well, I'm afraid he'll ask me to teach a Sunday school class. If he does, it's got you on the plans. You can do it. There's a thousand things that this church can do. And there's a great need for love out there in this world. There's a great need for a touch because this world is lonely. This world is hurting. They don't know the answer. And we can't hoard the answer. We've got to let the Lord flow through us. It's the greatest life around. I would not trade what I, where I am, what I'm going through, what I have been through, what God has planned for me to go through. I would not trade it at all. Because it is God's best for me. I wouldn't trade it for all the money of those idiots out there that have it. I don't care. They can live for the money and they'll die and leave it behind. It's not what you accumulate of all the wood, hay, and stubble down here. It's the gold that you send to heaven ahead of time. And we're doing that day by day. Don't think you're small and don't think you're great big. 
you're exactly the size in exactly the place with the exact anointing that you need to fulfill His purposes in you. If you'll let Him. If you'll let Him. There's only one thing this church needs. is Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, if you've got an unsettled spirit in your heart, if you have questions, if you don't have hope, if you're not sure, please, if you'll give your all to Him, He'll give His all to you. Both today and forevermore. And Christians, you know, Ben Christie's here, but Ben Waldrop's not here. When Jimmy was one of the most talented people I've ever met. He could do so much, Jimmy Walter. But you know, he died without a will. Then you have to go through intestate. So that's why Wink's coming. Wink's a good Christian man. And, and people put off. They don't want to talk about death. They don't want to talk about, you know, it's all going to be fine. They'll be in heaven. They'll let everybody else work it out. That's not the way it ought to be. Well, I, I, I know I need to have a will. And, and if you ask them, somebody that question, they'll say, of course, everybody needs a will. Why don't we do the will now? <coughs> if you're procrastinating, letting the Spirit have His way and working for Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, <laughs> what are you waiting for? we got vacation Bible school in two weeks. It should not be that people have to come and say, well, I don't know if I want to do that. I, I'm not gonna. It should be this place can be absolutely filled with people who just want to be a blessing to somebody. What can I do to be a blessing? How can I be a blessing? Inviting people to church. You're waiting for somebody else to invite someone to church. Why don't you invite someone to church? Share your testimony. I've done quit preaching and gone to meddling. You don't have to hear my voice, but you must obey his.